I'm good. <clears throat> it is five o'clock, time to begin our afternoon worship. We're glad that you're here this evening. Very special welcome to any guests that we have with us. Tonight is uh, the last, I guess, of our senior sermons. For those of you that may be visiting tonight, we, uh, we have a school of preaching here at Brown Trail, and we are about to uh, graduate, I think, seven uh, guys, seven from the school uh, here in a couple of weeks. And uh, as we approach graduation time uh, each year, we allow the senior students to preach their senior sermon. So we've been doing that periodically over the last couple of months. And uh, tonight uh, is uh, the last of those senior sermons. We're pleased, pleased to have uh, Brother Chuck Morrell here with us. And uh, Chuck is a native of Dallas, uh, born and raised there, worships with the Beckley Heights Church of Christ uh, in Dallas, on the south side of Dallas. I've worshiped there a number of times myself over the years. And uh, uh, Chuck is uh, getting ready to graduate, looking forward to that, I know, and is looking for uh, uh, a full-time uh, position. He's still searching for that and hopefully to find one in the Dallas area. And we'll be praying to that end that, uh, that something comes through for you in that regard. And so we look forward to Chuck preaching to us uh, in just a few minutes. And uh, we'll turn the service over now to... Uh, Brian, who will be directing our singing tonight. Let's worship together. And before I forget, be sure and fill out an attendance card and pass it to the aisle. The young men will be picking it up at the end of the service. First song this evening is number 180. 180.
934. 934. Number 238, 238, following this song we'll have our opening prayer.
Shall we pray? Dear Holy Father, we pray to you as the great I am, the one and only, the one that will always be and always has been. We thank you for giving us this avenue of prayer where we can come to you and ask for your blessings, ask that you help us in our life. We thank you for this life and we thank you for the blessings of this life that you've given us. Dear Lord, we ask that you be with those that were mentioned this morning that were sick and we be with those that uh, are caring for them that they may return them to their health and be with their loved ones to give them comfort also. We ask that you be with Julia's family and her passing, that you give them comfort, um, that we reflect on her life and what a, what a blessing she was and what an example she was, that uh, we strive to be more like her, that make us better Christians. And we, we thank you for allowing her to be in our lives. We ask that you be with the leaders of this church, that you will give them strength and bless their families, that uh, keep them safe and healthy. We ask that you be with the men and women that work in the works of this church, the School of Preaching, Truth and Love, the, Brother Warren as he works with the young, the young people, that they will, they will do the things to help those young men and women grow up to be good Christians and that they will be faithful Christians. We ask that you be with Brother Morell as he brings the lesson tonight, that uh, he will remember the things that he's studied and be able to bring those to us, that we will be able to use those in our lives. We ask that you be with his family and him as he graduates from school and that you will find a position for him in your, in your service, that uh, he will be blessed and his family will be blessed and well taken care of. We ask that this... This worship tonight will be pleasing in thy sight, that we will do things according to your will. Thank you for allowing your son to die on the cross for our sins and the, the simple plan of salvation that you have set in motion for us, that we will have eternal life with you one day. We offer this prayer in your son's name. Amen. If you're using the book... Please mark the invitation song. It'll be number 255. 255. After you've done that, let's turn to number 71. This will be the song before the sermon. Number 71.
seated, please. We're reading from uh, John chapter 6, verses 44 through 45. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. I'd like to say good evening to everyone. Well, I have good news for you. I am the last speaker. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm the very last one. And I'd like to thank everyone that has uh, helped me along and get into this point. Uh, thank you for your fine preacher uh, at the parish and for the elders here for allowing me this opportunity to uh, speak for you. And I have some more good news for you. I will try my best. I will try my best. I don't see a clock, but I'll try my best. Oh, there it is. I will try my best not to be long, because I, I was told that I have a time limit. So without further ado, let me get on with my point so we can go home for the evening. You know, we live in a world of technology and when you see all this wonderful technology, the one thing that comes to my mind, it takes education to have that technology. And so what, what you really want to see here when I'm, when I'm making this point here is that it takes education to have this technology. When you go to the doctor and you have doctors operating on you, you know that they need to have education when they operate on you because you don't want someone that's uneducated in that field cutting on your body or giving you medicine that you don't need. So it takes education. You know it takes education when you have someone that's just sued you or you're going to a court of law and you have a lawyer. You want your lawyer to know what he's talking about. He has to have education, right? Well. And you definitely want someone to have education when they're dealing with your money. Yeah, you do. Because the last thing that you want is to have a dummy over your money. So you definitely want them to be educated as an accountant. Well, with all that being said, with all that being said, one of the most important things that you can have and we need to have because it's fundamentally important that you have it is that you have to have education when it comes to your salvation. You cannot and you will not enter into the pearly gates of heaven being ignorant of salvation. And so the title of my lesson that you just read from John 6 and verse number 44 is salvation comes by education. Salvation comes by education. And so in dealing with that subject, I want to deal with a few things that we will have to deal with as Christians in dealing with people on how salvation does not come. And I have a long list, but I'm not going over all of them. I'm only going to point out maybe a few. But there is a long list of things that we have to deal with when we try to help people to understand what salvation is about. And a lot of people do not know, they think they do, but a lot of people do not know what it takes to be saved. And so there are some scenarios that will come up when you're trying to teach them and I'm going to make a, I'm going to go over this list with you and then I'm going to go over one that's very very hot and I'm trying to help us and see if we can apply this to our lives when we're teaching other people about salvation and one of them is salvation does not come 
by your expectations. Does anybody know the story of Naaman the leper? Anybody know this story? Well, yeah, this, this is yes, this is no, this is I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, okay, you do know what that you, okay, you do. Second Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. You have a man there by the name of Naaman. Now, Naaman was, I'm paraphrasing for time's sake because I want to get to the last point here. But Naaman was all that and a bag of chips with the dip. He had it going on. His life was all right. He was a mighty man of valor, but the Bible says, but, and you know, when you see the word B-U-T, that's a contrast. It's a problem there. You know, there are people that have everything going on in their life, and they, they have a beautiful wife, a handsome husband, lovely kid, nice paying job, but there's always a but somewhere, and it's called sin. And we have to deal with that on a daily basis. Well, this man here had leprosy. That was his problem. He didn't have a cure for it. Well, he was told, he was told that, hey, there's a prophet by the name of Elijah that could tell you what you need to do to remove this leprosy. Now, God was being gracious. Well, his problem was, his problem was, when he came there with his entourage to go see Elijah, Elijah didn't even bother to come out. He just said, go dip in Jordan River seven times and your, your skin will be made whole. Well, in verses number 10 and 11, this man was hot. And I mean fish grease hot. You know, that's really hot. You know, if you've ever fried catfish, you have to get the, the grease very, very hot. Well, this man was very, very hot is what I'm telling you. He was very angry. Well, the problem was, the problem was, the Bible goes on and said, what did you get mad for, Naaman? Because he said, I thought God didn't ask him what he thought. God was gracious enough to tell him what he needed to do to remove this leprosy. How many times do we have Bible class with people and they come up with this, well, I feel, well, I think God didn't ask you what you felt or what you thought. God's word is instructing, you know, this is, you know, what's the problem with this thing here? It might be too big. You know how us men, we, you know, we try to put stuff together. And when we put stuff together, we see these big, long instructions. What do we do with the instructions? We put the instructions up and we think that we can figure it out for ourselves. We think that we feel that we can do it all on. Well, the last time I checked, the last time I, I, I read in the Bible, there is no way you can remove sin without Jesus. So Jesus gives us instructions on how to remove our sins. So Naaman, he was thinking on his own, can I just go to these other rivers and can I be clean? Trying to make suggestions to God. When the last time you saw someone try to teach God anything? Let me see a show of hands. For the record, there is no hand. Because you cannot instruct God on anything. God is the one that does the instruction. And he graciously gives us the instructions on what we need to do to be saved. God didn't have to do that. But since he loved us, he did that. Now, the last time I checked, Proverbs 3 and verse number 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not upon thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he, not you, but he will direct thy path. So that's a problem that you have to deal with. Next, let me move on because I'm trying to hurry up here. Salvation does not come by sensation. Salvation doesn't come by sensation. What do you mean? Well, you have people that, and I'm not trying to make fun of anybody, but you do have people. <clears throat> they think they felt something thought they got something, thought they heard something, thought they saw something. And it's just like, ooh, the Holy Ghost has got a hold of me. Folks, that's not how a person is to be saved. The last time I checked in the Bible, the last time I saw it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses number 12 through 13, the Holy Spirit doesn't grab a person, make them wiggle and jiggle and fall out or make them take off running. What are you running for? Sit down somewhere and let the Lord instruct you on how to be saved because the Holy, not the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Spirit teaches. 
it doesn't make you react in the way that you're having a seizure or anything. That's not the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a spirit, but that's not holy. So, uh, uh, so let's quit blaming things on the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit teaches people how to be saved. Let me move on. Uh, salvation does not come by private interpretation. Oh, I, you know, there are people that will tell you that they had this vision and they, and they, and they think that God has spoken to them okay you know some of these are some of these will be wrapped really tight with these these points that i'm making that you have to deal with well some people think that you know that the bible is their own interpretation you know there are some people that have started churches now churches that are not in the bible that you won't find in anybody's bible of any version of anybody's Bible, and they've started churches based on what they said God said to them, which, by the way, God hadn't said anything to anybody. How does God speak today? How does God speak today? God speaks through his word. That's how he speaks today. He doesn't speak through some secret voice that you just thought that you heard and you was by yourself. And Why is it that people say that God spoke to them and, and no one else has heard God speaking? Why is it that? Well, that's because they're lying on God. God speaks through Jesus, Hebrews 1 and verse number 1. God has spoken to us in these last days by his son. That's Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus, how are you speaking today? John chapter 7 and verse number 38. He that believeth on me as the scripture have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So how are we to believe on Jesus today? And how is Jesus speaking today? Jesus is speaking through the Bible. So I suggest to us that we pick up the Bible and we read it because that's where salvation is. Anybody, listen, if anybody come to you and tell you that God said something to them, ask them what did they say? And then if they tell you, how you know God said that? Well, let's just open up the Bible and see if God said that. You know what? They don't want that because they want you to follow them based on their private interpretation. And the Bible still says that the prophecy of Scripture is of no private interpretation. So you can't go by that. Next, let's just see what if salvation Hear me well, especially for you parents out here. Salvation doesn't come by intimidation. You know, grandma, bless her heart, she would she see grandson or she 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 her little little babies and she wanted to be baptized. Mama does too. I'm not picking on grandma. I'm not picking on mama, but sometimes there are some kids that have come down here. They were baptized. Why were you baptized? Because my mama told me to. She said, I get a whooping if I didn't do it. Have you heard that? Have you been have you been done like that before? I have. Mama, you know, mama wanted her baby to be saved. I get it. But that's not how salvation comes. And please do not jam Jesus down anybody's throat. Don't beat anybody over the head with the Bible. Because the last, th you know, the last thing they need is for you to just bash them upside the head and you live in Rome. Okay? So you're trying to scare them into the church. Boy, you better get baptized. I'm going to whoop you. That's not how it works. But I've seen that happen before. I suggest to you, parents, you instruct your kids on how to be saved. And when they are ready, when they can tell you everything about salvation, they're ready. If they, can, if they can give you book, chapter, and verse, and they practically beating down the door for their salvation, let them be baptized. But please do not make them be baptized. Teach them, instruct them to be baptized. Because there are too many that have left the Lord's church because they were made to obey God when they didn't want to. Now, keep this in mind. Yes, you ought to teach your kids, and they need to obey God. But if you are just jamming it down their throat, they're not going to listen to you later on when they get older. I suggest to us that we teach our kids and us the word of God. Next, salvation doesn't come by just any kind of information. There are some people, even in our brotherhood, that think that if you don't intellectually stimulate them, 
you can't tell them anything. You know, we have some people that have doctor's degrees. I'm not, hey, I'm not knocking the degree. I'm about to get my little certificate later on. So I'm not knocking education. Get it. But please don't walk in here like you have rose petals under your feet because you've gotten a degree and no one can talk to you about salvation. That's the last thing you need to do. You know, we have some people. Have you ever read Acts 17 where the, the Stoics and the Epicureans, all they wanted to do was hear some new knowledge? To, and if you couldn't tell them anything, they really wasn't listening to you. We have some brothers like that now. Salvation, hear me well, does not come by any kind of information. You can get in. We are living in an age of, uh, uh, of information. You can get the wrong information. You know, you can get the wrong information. You can. The Internet has the wrong information about Jesus. The Internet has the wrong information about the Church of Christ, which, by the way, the Church of Christ is the only church in the Bible. You don't have to look, up, you don't have to look that up in the Internet. You know where you can go? Right to the Bible. You don't have to go to the Internet for that. You don't have to go to an encyclopedia. There are some people that do not believe that Jesus ever existed. Where'd they get the information from? They got the information from, from the Internet or from some, some person that doesn't believe that Jesus ever existed. So you can get the wrong information from anywhere. Salvation does not come by self-proclamation. What does that mean? I have a relative who proclaims now. She gets a bottle of water, puts lemon juice in it, sprays around the walls, and she said That's, that represents the Holy Spirit to keep the demons out. She said that. And I said, where do you read where lemon juice is even an equation to say, where do you read that? Lemon juice and water has nothing. Now, blood and water, but lemon juice and water? And you think that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in your house because you sprayed this stuff in your house? No, no, that's not how it works. That's not. I know it doesn't work like that because the same person that said that started using explicatives, started cussing someone out. So how in the world are you keeping the demons out by spraying this when you're acting like a demon yourself? Yeah. So that's not how that's not how salvation comes. Salvation does not just it doesn't come by self-proclamation. Let me give you an example. I'm about to proclaim something. I'm about to proclaim. I am a millionaire. I'm really not a millionaire. And I go to the bank and I proclaim that I have money in your bank and I have a million dollars. Sir, you don't have an account with it. Yes, I do. I'm proclaiming that I do. They're going to hit this little special button <laughs> and say, we have a man in here that's trying to proclaim something that he cannot proclaim, that he does not have. What am I saying to you? There are some people that proclaim that Jesus is in their life. How do you know you saved? Well, I know I'm saved. How do you know? Well, I just know I am. Okay, that's circle of reasoning. Okay, can you pick up the Bible and show without a shadow of a doubt <clears throat> that you are saved? Because if you can't, then you're not. The word of God is the validation for your salvation. And if you cannot honestly go to the Bible and see how you will say, then chances are you need to do another proclamation that I'm not saved and I need to find the Lord in this book. So salvation does not come by any of these ways. And I'm telling you, you will deal with this. Whoever you talk to, you will have to deal with one of these situations. Now let me get to the last one. And this right here is the hottest one of all. And what I mean by that, you can have somebody put their hands on you about this one. You can get kicked out of the house. You can have someone try to hurt you over this one that we're about to talk about. I want you to get for me John chapter 8. I'm about to park right there. John chapter 8. This one here, this last one here, 
is by far the hottest one. And I've, I've seen it and I've actually been kicked out of a house or two because of this question that comes up. And I'm going to try to help us to deal with this hot situation because it will come up if you're trying to teach people what to do to be saved. John chapter 8 and verses number 31, I want you to notice here, then Jesus, then Jesus, uh, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now that's Jesus, up close and personal, confrontational. He is the truth personified he is the living word and he's the truth and he's the truth telling the truth to these people on what they need to do to be free this next verse is the problem they answered him we be abraham's seed what's the problem here you just had the truth told to you you're looking at the truth you understand the truth and then you bring up a relative and in particular, a dead relative. Folks, this right here, salvation does not come by generation. What do you mean salvation doesn't come by generation? Well, look at who they brought up. They brought up their kinfolk. They brought up someone that was dead, too. Now, how many times have you had Bible class with people and the truth is close? It's personal. They understand the truth. They know what you're saying. They know what the Bible is saying about salvation. And what do they do? They bring up Big Mama. They bring up Maudil, Paw Paw, Meemaw, Big Daddy, or whoever, whatever you call your relative. They bring up their cousin, aunties, uncles, niece, nephew. Some, and then they bring up someone that's died. And then they say the magic question that we try to avoid. Don't avoid this question. Are you trying to tell me I'm going to die and go to hell if I'm not a member of your church? <laughs> and they are, they are mad right then, right there, and they daring you to answer that question. How do you answer that question? How you deal with it? All the Bible has, a, the Bible has an answer for it. You don't have to run away from it. You don't have to run away from it. You start dealing with it in love and because this is very, this is very, very sensitive. And you have to be loving and sensitive to people. First of all, don't ever say, yeah, they're going to hell. Don't, please don't say that. Because that's what they're looking for. They're already mad when they ask you. They're emotional. And they don't want to listen to you in the first place if you say yes because they want to slam the door and they want to use that as an excuse for you not to continue the Bible study. Y'all understanding this? Okay. How do you handle that? How do you handle that? Well, first of all, you ask them, you ask them, why would you ask me about someone that's dead and gone? Why would you? Salvation is not based on, off of your relative or a dead relative. So before you want to get mad at me about a question like that, do you think that that's fair to ask a question like that, knowing that you will get mad and walk out the door on me? Why would you ask a question like that? You start diffusing this thing right then, right there. So you ask them a question. Secondly, what does that have to do with your salvation what does it have to do with you you cannot and should not base your salvation off of someone that's dead and gone i don't know your grandma or big mama or papa or me i don't know them so i don't know their situation and even if i did that's not changing your situation it's not changing it you have to deal with salvation for you we are talking to you thirdly you tell them we're not talking about going to hell. And you smile at them. We're talking about going to heaven because that's where we're trying to get to. Let's just say Big Mama went to heaven. That doesn't mean that you're going to win, does it? No. 
So you deal with it in a loving way. Let's just, you know, let, we're not talking about going to hell. We don't need to go to hell. We don't want to go to hell. Why? Because God doesn't want us to go to hell in the first place. Why in the world do you think he sent Jesus to, uh, to, to die for us in the first place? Because he wants us to be saved, but we cannot be saved through someone else. And let's just go. Let's just start going. Now, if I go fast, just take notes because I don't want to keep you long. But I want you to jot this down. Whoever's keeping notes. But I want us to turn to Leviticus chapter 10. And let's just deal with this. And then we're going right down the line. Leviticus chapter 10. Most of us know the biblical account. Of Leviticus chapter 10. Most of us know this, right? Okay. But for somebody that doesn't know it, let's just go over there and let's just take a look and see what Leviticus chapter 10 has to say because there's a very important point that was made in Leviticus chapter 10. Most of us know this account. Well, you have Nadab and Abihu, right? Nadab and Abihu. They were taught, they were instructed by their dad, Aaron, and Moses, how to come before God, right? So they have no excuse. Well, they came before God. And the King James Version says, with strange fire. Some versions say unauthorized, meaning God didn't tell you to bring that to him. Well, they brought it to him anyway. Well, how did God feel about that? Well, God didn't take too kindly to that. And so, verse number two, and there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. You see that? Okay, they died. These are Aaron's babies. He raised them, cuddled them, nurtured them. He loved them. God killed them right on the spot. Why? Because they disobeyed God. Okay, the next verse. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is that that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. Now, I want you to notice this last part. And Aaron held his peace. My question to you is, what was Aaron going to say? Was he going to charge God and say, God, you wrong for killing my babies? Aaron, do you want some of this fire? You want some of this? Well, no. Well, the answer is no. Aaron didn't want any of that because he knew his sons were wrong. What am I telling you? Even if, and I want y'all to go back to John 8, even if, even if God was to send my relatives, your relatives to hell, there's nothing we could say about it anyway. It's not our business. That's God's. Is God wrong if he sent us all? To hell? Would God be wrong in sending us all to hell? Would he be wrong? The answer is no. The answer would be no. So since God is holy and righteous and just, we have no right trying to be mad about a holy and just and righteous and fair God who has given us instructions to avoid this kind of punishment. So to get mad about what God did, that's not going to do us any good. But go back now to John 8 as I get ready to wrap this thing up. John 8, let's go back over there because there's something else that people did not realize. John 8, and I want us to take a look. Now, Jesus has already told them the truth. Now, I want you to look after he's talked with them again and told him he'd be free. Look at verse number 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. They bring in, they bring in up a relative again. Folks, there are people that will be stuck on their relatives and they will base their salvation off of their relative, you have husbands and wives that will not obey the gospel of Christ because of a relative. They are afraid to obey the truth because they, they don't want to face the torment of the ridicule and the persecution that their relatives might bring on them. 
They don't want to face that. And we have to comfort them and let them know, listen, listen. God is a just and fair God. And I want you to turn your Bible, I want you to turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I want us to notice them in Acts 2 and verses number 40. Peter said, to save yourself from this untoward generation. I want you to notice what that what I just said. Because Peter said in Acts 2 and verses number 40, to save yourself. There's a reason why he had to say that. There's a reason why he had to say that. Well, in Philippians 2 and verses number 12, the Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have already obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own, not somebody else's, work out your own own salvation with fear and trembling whose salvation are you trying to work out you can't work out someone else's salvation because salvation doesn't come by your relatives in fact when we stand before judgment guess what's going to happen in Romans 14 12 we're all going to stand before God for ourselves that lovely wife that you sit next to that lovely husband that you sit next to your children they won't be able to vouch for you you have to stand before God for yourself. Oh, they look, y'all look so beautiful over here, but guess what? You're going to be by yourself. That, look, that, that, that handsome son that you hold, he won't be able to be there for you. Uh-uh. You have to stand before God for yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ by yourself. By whose standard? By God's standard. If you are putting your relatives before God, and you note this down, Matthew 10 and verses number 37. If you put any of your relatives, father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, before the Lord, you're not worthy of the Lord. Not worthy of them. So you cannot be saved by your relative, by your kinfolk, by your cousin, by your auntie, by your uncle. Don't bring them up. Because it doesn't work with the Lord. What we want to do is be saved for ourselves. Listen, when you obey the gospel of Christ, then you can tell people about Christ. And then it's up to them to obey the gospel of Christ. You can't make them do it. And it's only for themselves. You can only do so much with your relatives. And if they don't want to obey it, then that's them. But please don't get bent out of shape about your relatives, about salvation. So now, I want us to turn to 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, and then I'm going to extend the invitation because the invitation is for you personally. You have to obey God for yourself. And so 1 Peter 1, and I don't want to quote that, I want that read because... Quoting it doesn't mean we're explaining it. But 1 Peter 1, in verses number 18, I want you to watch this. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by traditions from who? Your fathers, that's your kinfolk. You will not be saved by your relatives, okay? But How? Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And then I want you to drop down to verses number 21. I want you to drop down right here. I want you to watch this. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that, notice, this is personal, that your faith. Well, what about my daddy's faith? I didn't say your daddy's faith. It said your faith. It's personal. That your faith faith and hope might be in God. You can't make everybody else be saved and you cannot be saved by your relatives. In fact, let's just say mom and daddy, they died. Let's just say that they, they good, they're in good standings with God and they're going to heaven. Let's just say that they do. Well, John 8 and verse number 44, when those people were trying to bring up, we be Abraham seed, we saved through Abraham. Uh-uh, uh-uh. The Lord said in John 8 and verse number 44, you are of your father, the devil. Well, wait a minute. What happened to my kinfolk? 
They might be saved, but that doesn't make you saved. You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So even if your mama, daddy, big daddy, papa, me, ma, grandma, whatever they are, even if they were saved, you can still be of the devil. So you know what you have to do? You have to obey God for yourself and not for somebody else. So now, how does salvation come? I told you, it comes by education. And I don't have time to go to, I don't have time to go to Luke 19, but you just go to Luke 16, I'm sorry, Luke 16 and 27 through 28. Even if they go to hell, guess what? They don't want you coming there if they go. They want you to stay out of that place and obey God. Well, how do we obey God? Well, Isaiah 2 and 2 says, it should come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow on it. Many people will come and say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. And this is the part that we run over. And he, that's God, will, what will he do? Teach, teach us what? Of his ways. God is going to teach us of his ways, not somebody else's way. What should we do about God's way? We shall walk in his path. That's what we should do. So now, how can I obey the gospel of Christ and have this salvation? Well, first of all, if you have not obeyed the gospel, then you need to hear how Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Do you believe that gospel? Well, if you don't, you need to, because Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And where I am, and you want to be where he is, where I am, you cannot come. John 8 and verses number 24. Once you believe that, you must repent of your sin. What does repentance mean? Repentance means to change your mind. And when you change your mind, you change your ways. You change your ways from your way to God's way. Quit trying to do it your way because that won't work. Luke 13, 3 and verses number five. And please, if you think Jesus was joking, he actually said it twice. So, you know, he wasn't joking around with that. Now, does God want anyone to perish? No. Second Peter three and verse number nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering. Why hasn't God struck us down? Because he's long suffering. And you want that. He's long suffering, not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. Now, once you made up your mind to do it the Lord's way and not yours. Then you confess that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Make that confession, Matthew 10 and verses number 32. Well, what, what, what if I don't? Well, I tell you what, verse number 33, if you don't confess Jesus now, he won't confess you later. And look, I go by Chuck. My professional name is Charles. I can't stand it. But you, guess what? When I stand before God, I don't care what he called me. I don't care what name he called me. As long as he called me Chuck, Charles, as long as he acknowledges me is what I'm telling you. When you stand before God, you want God to acknowledge you. You do not want to stand before God. Uh, Jesus, it's father talking. Jesus, do you know, uh, you know such and such? No, I don't know one. You don't want to hear that. Whatever your nickname is, your pet name is, your honey name is, you want the Lord to acknowledge you. So confess that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Once you make that confession, you are baptized. Why? Because Jesus said so. I'm not going all over the Bible to prove baptism. I just need one verse. Matthew 28, 18. A couple of verses since I said that. Matthew 28. 18 through 20, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. That's Jesus talking. Now, he gave a command. What was the first one? Go. Well, they went. Then he said to teach. They taught. That was a command. The next one was 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. So if go was a commandment and they followed it, they taught, which was a command, and they followed it. What they teach? Well, in Acts 2.38, they taught them to be baptized because that was a commandment. So if any one of us are thinking, and some of you religious gurus out here, thinking that baptism is not essential, Jesus made it a command. So since Jesus made it a command, that means you have to do it. Go down in the watery grave of baptism. And here's the reason why. If Jesus didn't even give us a reason why, we just need to do it because he said so. But he gave us a reason why. It's for the remission of sin. It's to wash our sins away. Acts 22 and verse number 16. It's for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38. It adds you to the church. 1 Corinthians 12 and verses number 13. The Lord doesn't add anybody to his church. Which one? The Lord, which one? It's the church of Christ. And that's the only church that you can find in anybody's of any version Bible. It's the only one. And everyone can and should be a member of the Lord's church. Matthew 16, 18. Acts 2 and verses number 47. Once you are added to that church, continue to be faithful. Don't just live your life any kind of way. Revelation 2.10. Be faithful even if it kills you. Be faithful. Now, once you do that, and if the Lord comes back, or if he comes back anytime soon, or we die, okay, whichever one it is, we're going to meet the Lord one day. And it is going to be glorious because we've done what the Lord said to do. And it is going to be wonderful. That sweet little baby that you had that you was holding, he'll be with you. That handsome husband, that lovely wife, we can all be together one day in heaven because we know for a fact we were educated by God's word. And we can be with God forever because we followed his ways. Now, if you just need prayer, if you need prayer, I suggest you don't, don't walk out that door the same way you came. Take advantage of the opportunity while you have a chance because salvation also doesn't come by procrastination. Don't wait too long because you might wait one day, one time too many. Don't wait. Now, if you need any prayer, if we can help you in any way, I suggest that you do so while we together stand. Come on now, while we together stand and sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, John. If you're in need to take the Lord's Supper, it has been prepared for you. If you will come forward during the singing of this next song and sit on the front pews, you will be served. It is in the back of the book, if you're using the book, How Deep the Father's Love.
pray. Father in heaven, we come to you at this time in remembrance of your son. Father, your son who you sent to die for us. Father, we were not worthy, we are not worthy of that death that he gave on the cross. He was punished, Father, for our sins. Father, we're, we're thankful, so thankful for this gift. And we're thankful now for this time that we have to commemorate his death on that cross for us. Please help those who are about to take of this bread that represents the body given for us. Help them take their minds back to the cross. In Christ's name, amen. Let's pray. Father, we continue this memorial of Jesus through this taking of this great juice, symbolic of his blood. We know we're not worthy, but this is a memorial of the blood that he shed for us there on the cross. Thank you so much for Jesus and for his sacrifice for us. Help us to remember this and to live our lives in such a way as to honor that sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, you've blessed us so richly, and, and Father, we now have this time to give back a small portion of, of what is already yours, Father, and help us to do so cheerfully and help this, uh, the elders who oversee this congregation to use what is given wisely. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, before our closing song, if you haven't passed your cards to the aisle, please do so. The young men are going to pick it up, pick them up during this, this song. It's in the supplement if you're following the book or using the book. And let's stand for our closing song in the prayer, prayer to follow.
Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great and wonderful day you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to worship and praise you, sing songs of praise, and be here, Father, unobstructed in any way. We thank you for the speaker tonight, Father, for the great sermon that we heard. We pray that you would be with him and help him to find a job and to be able to go and spread your word, Father. Father, we pray for all who are sick and who are ill, for those who are struggling with anything, Father, we pray that you'd be with us and watch over us. Please be with us as we go out through this week and help us to be light shining in this world, Father, and be with us until we come back at the next appointed time. We thank you again for your son, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.